we have some opportunities for comedy this week, some further opportunities for comedy, not the foot free beam routine that Jessica just created. Um, we need to give, so we ne- have a new award apparently, which is the high five in the face of the week, because as we've discussed, gymnasts can uh, do beam routines, but cannot walk on the ground. They also cannot high five. And we maybe need to integrate this into early training, like how you always say ballet should be integrated into early training. High five lessons, I think, are really an underrated point, and we need to work on them more because it's getting to be a problem, as Janelle McDonald learned this week. Remember, the show is PG-13, so you might hear a naughty word or two. Norbert's is having a sale on Taiwanese chalk. You can get the whole block Go to Norbert's.com. It's .com now, you guys, for a 10% discount off anything with the code Jimcastic. Just Jimcastic. You don't need any months attached, just Jimcastic. Norbert's is also giving away a $50 Norbert's gift card that can be used on anything in their online store. No minimum. Just follow Norbert's Athletic on Instagram and then like and comment on the giveaway post. It's been a big week. Updates on the New Zealand situation. The anti-Melanie enforcement rule in our elite system in the U.S. Shakeups and defeats in NCAA meets. We have a corrupt or correct on Shea Campbell's Black Panther floor routine. It's the 50th anniversary of the layout. Step out on beam. And Georgia suffers from NCAA violations. (laughs) We'll discuss. It's January 29th, 2024. And welcome to the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm Jessica. I'm here with Spencer from the Balance Beam Situation. And I would like to start this week with something that explains in the one video. Let's, Mm -hmm. if you're, you can watch along with us. This is a video posted by Iowa of mostly the Michigan State team, but it's an Iowa gymnast and a um, MSU gymnast having a dance-off in a circle all together. This is why we love, and it's they're going so hard, these two. <laughs> it is... <laughs> this is why fantastic. Karina Munoz and Skyla Schulte always make our list of the ones who are doing it correctly, as in the most on floor yes i would like if there's gonna be another tour i would like these two to be on the tour because their floor routines they could do one together that would be but this is Mm -hmm. what i'm saying guys they're they are great dancers they're doing it all and iowa posted this about the two of them dancing together like this is why we love college gymnastics because it's just like fun and the like the competition is there but it's like who cares if the other you're having a dance off with the other team anyway (laughs) there's less competition more art is what i'm saying Mm. depending on who you think also a good lesson that floor performance is not an in the moment thing it's a lifestyle you live your ability to perform on floor through every moment even if you're not being scored for a floor routine right then as they have shown us exactly thank you spencer That is the lesson. (laughs) Okay, we have an update on the Courtney McGregor situation. Mm. So, Courtney McGregor, athlete, New Zealand, Olympian, went to Boise State, tore Achilles, couldn't do Tokyo, medical school, comes back. We talked about it last week, has been training, and then suddenly was told, eh, you didn't compete for the last few years, so basically you can't do any elite means, you can't qualify to Paris. So the question that we had about this was like, well, what about Georgia Rose Brown? Because Georgia Rose Brown, great Australian athlete. This is not having anything to do with her. We're super stoked for her. But why is she allowed to compete in these meets for New Zealand when Courtney McGregor is not? So Georgia Rose Brown got um, switched her nationality to New Zealand, which is Mm -hmm. fine. Everybody can do that. But normally there's a two or three year waiting period to compete. But what we found out is that. Yeah. Uh, Georgia Rose Brown. The three year rule between the last time you competed for your original nationality is what the rules say. And then they say, oh, but there's an exception if you get approval from everybody. Yes. And she got the exception. So thank you to the reporting from Inside the Games. She did get the exception, which means that she does not have to sit out despite having um, competed for Australia in a world championships or an Olympics. She was in the uh, Liverpool world. She competed for Australia. She is allowed to go ahead and compete for New Zealand. So 
this explains a lot, I think. I think New Zealand was like, oh, you're our, you're going to be our Olympian. Here we go to George Rose Brown, which good for her. <laughs> do what you have to do. It's a competition. So that's the update about that. Bummed for Courtney McGregor and hope that she um, sticks around. But also medical school and elite gymnastics at the same time. How did these, these are not normal people, you guys. This is what mm. I want. They're not normal people. That don't compare <laughs> yourself to elite gymnasts. Just in case you were tempted, you're not like them. Don't compare <laughs> yourself. I'm just saying. Like, maybe you are. You're one of those exceptional people. Like the 15 doctors who are like full-time doctors and also judge gymnastics on the weekends. Because, you know. But anyway, you guys. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. We also have an update on the, what we're calling the no, we changed our mind. Melanie can't compete rule. So last year, Melanie de Jesus dos Santos of France uh, competed at U.S. Classic. It was amazing. And we got Simone and Melanie together. Melanie got to be coached by her WCC coaches, Cecile Laurent. Um, it was just the happy. It was like a giant party. It almost was like a college meet. That's how much fun it was. Um, and then we got news in the IEC minutes, the International Elite Committee minutes, that they were like, mm. We're going to go ahead and enforce the rules this year. So, Spencer, can you explain? Can you explain? No, no, I can't. But one of the things I wanted to go back to that we talked about last week was we questioned what the actual definition of a foreign athlete is. Because in the elite committee minutes in their meeting, they said they've decided that foreign athletes can't compete at Winter Cup U.S. Classic this year. And we were questioning how does that apply to an athlete that maybe has U.S. citizenship but has an FIG license, used, maybe used to have an FIG license for the U.S., now has an FIG license for another country who's qualified to the Olympics. Can Luisa Blanco compete? Can Aaliyah Finnegan compete? Emma Malabuyo? How does it apply to them? So in the uh, USAG elite rules and policies, they do specifically use the language to describe what foreign athlete means. And it says, quote, they've represented another country in international competition regardless of citizenship. So that tells us that if you, you're representing another country, you class of, are classified as a foreign athlete. And generally, while, you know, sorting through the USAG rules and policies will make anyone, like, maybe resort to arson or something as you try to be like, well, now, wait, what does this apply to? And how is this section different from the one six pages ago that says the exact same thing but also kind of different? And maybe it starts to be about tops and then it's about senior women's elite and you're like, I can't even deal with this. But basically, when reading the USAG rules and policies, they absolutely have cover to deny participation to Melanie at all of these means. They are, they can point to, you know, paragraph C of blah, blah, blah. They absolutely have cover. I think what they still need to answer is why they were okay with very reasonably applying exception standards to Melanie last year to compete at U.S. Classic, even though that's in the on the pathway to world championship selection, but they're not this year. Like, What changed? What are you reacting to? And this is what I've always asked um I've like, and I've suggested to the, this to a committee member as well. Is like, when you make rules and on your, you're on a committee, like the way that it works in, say, U.S. government is there's committee meetings. They discuss what they're going to do with a rule or what they're going to do with a law. They look at evidence. They look at studies. And there's a, a meeting minutes that talk about their reasoning for things. Why? Why are we not going to do this? Why are we going to do this? Sometimes there's tape recordings of the meetings. Right. What I wish U.S. Gymnastics system done so many great things with transparency it's way better than it used to be you guys just trust me um <laughs> it, it really it is they've made so much progress but what i wish is that they would have a notation about why they made decisions and the reason for that is um not only for the sake of everyone understanding um and not wondering why this was done why was it why did they go against their own policy one year and then follow their policy the next year but also it's because you want to be able to look back like say there's someone that's on this committee for the first time they don't know the reasons for why things were done in the past they can go back and look at effectively a legislative history of why these rules were made like what happened in 1980 when we used to invite foreign athletes or whatever you know i'm using this as an example we used to invite yep. foreign athletes to train with us. We learned so much from them. Why are we, you know, not allowing it now? 
So why not just say what we found was it would be fine if it was an athlete that nobody knew, but because Melanie is so popular internationally, we felt she got, you know, too much of the media attention and, uh, or something like that. I mean, Simone was there, like clearly, you know, Melanie did not get all the media attention, but, um, you know, just put a little note in there. Why did we make this decision? And then someone can go back and look and just saying we're following the policy is not really an answer, I think. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what, we still don't know why. Let's talk about, um, some other headlines that are happening. Yes. This very week. Well, one of the headlines, I think, elite, before we get to college gymnastics, because if you haven't heard, <laughs> people are still upset about the scores. Sunrise, sunset. But um, elite things to talk about. You're going to national team camp. We're T minus five months until the U.S. Olympic team is named at this point. So I want to talk about anticipation for this elite camp national team camp what is what are we looking out for what's happening first of all question so this is not a selection camp for any means not, right or not is a selection camp no okay as because... far as i know for seniors or juniors it's not a selection camp yes that is my, is my assumption as well although the selection procedures for like stuttgart and yesolo are not on the usag website yet which would be helpful last year winter cup was used as the competition as the selection competition for seniors for those meets so i would assume it's the same this year we want to talk about something weird that happened if you came across this page on flip now which is usa gymnastics um streaming service that they have there was a page that said that they were streaming camp on February 5th. Um, and now mm -hmm. we just went back to confirm it and now the page is gone. Yes, it was quietly removed. It was surprising to us to begin with because as far as we know, this is not a selection camp and the USAG has typically not streamed the meet if it wasn't a selection for anything. So we were surprised and pleased. Like, oh, we get more exposure but is this real um it seems like no <clears throat> jess is gonna be there and we're having our live podcast the day after in the morning so you will talk about it and i'll tell you everything that i saw then the things that i'm kind of looking toward like this yeah. these are my questions that i'm going into camp with mm -hmm. i you know there's number one obviously i'm mean, looking how simone is doing right is she did she <laughs> is she going for some crazy thing so she can have also a skill named after her on bars? Like, I don't think it's gonna happen. But you know, where is she? How's she doing? What's she up to? Is there anything fun she's adding? Or she's just like, these are my routines. I can do them in my sleep. This is what I'm doing. Um, also, I'm looking at um, you know, we don't know who's gonna be at camp yet, but I'm very interested to see how Jordan and Jade are doing. Um, if they come to camp versus somebody like Trinity. Um, and how they're all doing. We also did find out that Trinity is going to compete at Winter Cup and do all around. So that's exciting. So I don't know if she'll come because she has two weeks till, um, till Winter Cup. Um, you got to prioritize these veteran athletes have been around long enough to be like, I know what I need. I know what I need to go to and what I don't. And this is what's happening. And that's one of, among the reasons we love the adult women veteran athletes competing because they're like, no, I know what I'm doing listen to me <laughs> and that's a smart thing about like go to winter cup now qualify to championships and then you can just pace yourself and peak right mm -hmm. at the end of the championships you don't have to do any of these classics or any of this stuff or go to camp or whatever just qualify yourself now and then you can take a nap um because you know famously how that's very important simone has her hour and a half nap every day um the other thing I'm looking for is at the juniors because there is, and thanks to the gymter.net, you know how we love the gymter.net here and we link to them in every show. Um, they have a list of who's turning senior in 2024. And um, if you scroll down to the US, you can see who's turning um, a senior. And I'm really interested in who of these juniors, because there's always one, is going mm -hmm. to all of a sudden show up and snatch one of those senior spots who thought they were safe and maybe they already went to an Olympics or maybe they've been on all the world teams. Maybe they may make all the finals. And then there's a junior who's like, oh, I'm new to this and I'm taking all the spots. Anybody gonna bust out something? There's just somebody we haven't really paid attention to who all of a sudden has been waiting in the wings and they're 
going to have a 7.0 bar routine. And all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, they hit a 7.0 bar routine all the time. How do you leave this person off an Olympic team? Which obviously we think they would because we think they're just going to go in all around <laughs> order as usual. But that's kind mm. of, that's what I'm, I'm looking at. Yeah. Who might be in the- I think to to that point, but about not juniors, I'm interested to see if there's someone who has like the Jordan Childs pathway of last Olympic cycle, like two seconds ago, but you know, the it wasn't even a quad, but it feels like it was 900 years ago that the last Olympics were. But heading into the Olympic year, the narrative on Jordan Childs last time was still very like, all the talent in the world, of course, she hasn't put it together. She hasn't put it together consistently. She hasn't shown her hit difficulty in meets. And then we really saw her emerge through 2021 as, oh, not only are you now a contender when we had kind of written you off, but you are a lock for this team at a certain point in that process that she kept finishing like third all around and hitting. And so... I want to see if we see the germ or the birth of that for someone else who is just like, I figured it out at exactly the right time. And now all of the talent that I have shown since I was a junior and you've been excited about forever is all crystallized coming to fruition right at the exact correct time. Yes. And we will discuss it together as a family on Tuesday, that Tuesday after speaking of which some gymcastic updates. We are going to be at U.S. National Team Camp this week. Um, Meaning so you are going to be at U.S. National Team Camp this I'm week. I'm going to be there. I You're will be comfortably be, at home. You'll be a little spreadsheet with wings on one of my shoulders. <laughs> That's what yeah. happens. Um, so we're going to do a live podcast from camp, which is always open to our Club Gym Nerd members. And, a part, and that'll be our regular show as well. So that's Tuesday, February 6th at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Texas time. So I think that's 11. So take your lunch break early so you can join us live. It's 11 Eastern. 11 Eastern. Yeah, 11 Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. So that's on this coming Tuesday, uh, February 6th. If you're not already a club member, this is one of the reasons to join. These kind of behind-the-scenes special episodes for everyone. Um, Collagen Cocktails is Friday night, 8 p.m. Pacific. Yes. So this is February 2nd, Friday. We're doing 8 p.m. Pacific. So the main meet we're focusing on is going to be Oregon State against Utah, who we haven't really talked about in Collagen Cocktails yet this year. But we wanted to wait until 8 Pacific to start it because we also want to finish watching Oklahoma and Cal. Both are at Oregon State, and they're the one and two teams, and they're going to be at the same meet. So that seemed kind of important to watch and talk about, maybe. So we're going to do that as well. So 8 Pacific. So it's a little later, but, you know, just gives you time to get boozier before we start, which is always great. Always the Reveille, Releve Revolution meet. That's what I'm calling it. Oklahoma versus yeah. Cal. The precision off. Um, also, Fact Checker would like me to remind everyone that the drink for this week, which everyone has access to on the forum, um, is uh, up in the rankings, and it requires some prep that has to start now, unless, like Fact Checker, who's a total like chef nerd, um, you have a chamber vacuum sealer. Then you can do it in like 10 minutes right before the show starts, like Fact Checker does. So, um, Also, our new power ring- rankings are up. Fantasy Gymnastics, we have a new YouTube show, which we just give you all the updates. Who's a steal? How much is a 10 going to cost you? Uh, who are the people that you should add to your roster? Who's on a buy? Um, so that is up now. You can check it out on uh, YouTube. We have a live show virtual pass. It's only available to Club Gym Nerd members. So we're doing four live shows this year. Um, NCAs is the first one that we're doing. Um, infamous, the NCAA, NCAA live show. Yeah. Uh, NCAA Championships. And say live show, infamous for all the shenanigans that go down and how extremely fun it is. Um, and so that uh, you're going to get four live show tickets, virtual tickets for the price of three. And that's uh, only available to Club Gym Nerd members um, and before they go away after that first live show. Um, and of course, we have the Gymcastic Fantasy League in beta right now with weekly prizes. And this week, for week four, we are adding a mini commission winner. Check out gymcastic.com 
for all the details. If you want to share your favorite moments on the socials from the show, we'd love to share those. So if you want to share the audio, the video, anything you like, we always like to share those. So thank you so much to everybody who's who's sharing what they enjoy with the show. All right. College headlines, the rankings, yeah. drama. Kind of some drama. Yeah. I think there was some drama this week, some upsets. Um, I think the big ranking news, the big ranking mover this week was Kentucky going from number seven, moving up to number three, which is a huge deal for Kentucky top ranked team in the sec right now, which if you know anything about the sec, they care about that. <laughs> it's kind oh, of wow. a big deal. <laughs> if you are Kentucky and you can be like, guess who's ranked ahead of Florida and LSU? It us. Kind of a thing. So Kentucky scored a 197.95, which tied Cal for the highest score of the week this week. Two 10.0s. Mackenzie Wilson on vault, who we talked about, who has emerged as the monarch, uh, monarch of club handspring pike half in Kentucky's vault lineup. Because they have three of the six vaults in the lineup are handspring pike halves, which they've had for several years now. But now she is like, oh, you know what? I've got sticks. And so she stuck and got a 10. Raina Worley, floor 10. You kind of felt like this was a coronation meet for Kentucky and the way it was being scored. And everything was like, I feel like it's one of those things where you're like, this whole meet existed to build toward Raina Worley finishing the meet and getting a 10 on floor. And then she did. And you were like, yes, this is what happened. This is exactly I mean, what you expected Hansen, to happen based on him. Jenny Hansen was there, the three-time national champion. Uh, and Ryan got TV time. Our Ryan, the greatest Kentucky fan of all time. Uh, so, you know, it was a great meet all around. And Kentucky's in third. It's So I think it is as much as we are frustrated by how, you know, routines are being evaluated, which we'll get to in a second. It is fun that we're seeing Cal at number two, Kentucky at number three, teams that have typically, or at least recently, been in the top, but have not been like second and third spots that are usually we see like Florida there, Utah there. And so it is exciting to see different names there. And I think warranted based on the quality of gymnastics we're seeing. I have no issue with Kentucky, like even though the scores, you can look at them and be like, all right. Let's settle down for everyone. I have no issue with Kentucky currently ranking as the top SEC team based on quality of gymnastics. Yeah, I don't think that's inaccurate. I don't think any other team in that conference has shown the quality of routines to justifiably say, no, we should be ahead of Kentucky. And they they need to do this before Raina Worley graduates, first of all. I mean, in my heart... Well, yeah. Mizzou is the number one team in the SEC just for style and enthusiasm, joy of gymnastics. Uh, but yes, Kentucky, they're very good. They're very good. Um, UCLA had their first home meet. And they fi they fixed a lot based on yeah. what we had talked about, you know, last week the surprise low ranking they sort of figured it out they figured it out enough for a big score in this one 197 825 at home they moved up from number 15 to number 11 i think you feel like they're on a better path after seeing at least five of six routines and lineups you know they went for like florida they kind of went for it on vault they put up um page anastasi's yurchenko one and a half which she had been in the lineup with a full before. They went for the one and a half. She fell. They were able to drop the score like Florida, putting up Ellie Lazari's one and a half, and she fell. They were able to drop it. So they went for the risk and felt like it's January and can do that. Um, so they had to drop some falls. I'm still, you know, is equally as concerned about how the bars lineup's going to go when Malibuyo isn't there. I know. I'm like, who is, He's who going do, all over the place. We'll talk is, about her full schedule. Oh my God, I know. It's so stressful. I'm like, good for you, Emma. But I have like flop sweat thinking about like what she has to do and like all the planning and the like, oh, the scheduling. I'm like, this is again, they're not like us. Yes. Because it's I so stressful. Just <laughs> like, thinking oh my about God, Emma, you were, <laughs> you're, this is so stressful to me. Um, but with UCLA going back to the performance this weekend, emphasizing what we already knew that this floor rotation will win them meets. And that this is 
the highlight and can take a meet that was good, but not a huge ranking performance, like a solid meet through three rotations, and then yeah. turn it into one of the top scores of the weekend because of what they're able to do on floor positions one through six. Also, I will say the crux of the problem with judging that I should never have to be annoyed after a Brooklyn Moore's floor routine. But now because of the scoring, I am annoyed after a Brooklyn Moore's floor routine. And that is a mean thing to do to me because I should just be like, this is correct. This is correct floor, but you're going to make me mad, be mad now when she, you know, lands short on a front tuck and gets a nine, nine, five. I'm like, what are we doing here? This is why I tell you to never pay attention to the scores. It will ruin college gymnastics for you. God, why don't you just listen to me finally? If you want to enjoy the sport, don't <laughs> ever look at the scores. But I don't listen to you. But yeah, I think the score overall, the roller coaster that was the scoring of UCLA's floor rotation was a prime example of like, none of us know what we're doing here. And none of us are on the same page with what we're looking for. Because if you watched these routines, you're like, wait, how is that higher than that one? What are we ha what are we doing here? And then what are we doing there? Naya Reed goes, her two passes, fantastic. No notes, brilliant, wonderful. She basically tripped on her leap pass. Like something went weird. It was not normal. When she did split leap full, she kind of got around. But then when she rebounded in her wolf jump full attempt, she had to like swing her arms and swing her legs to try to fake it. It was bouncing around on landing. And it was like a good save. But also somehow she got 9925, which ties her season high. And it's like, so that just didn't matter. We just didn't right. see that. And yeah. then Shay goes, and I, this is what I want to ask about I want to corrupt or correct the Shay Campbell yeah. floor routine Let's score. Let's put this on in the background with why while we discuss it. Because then you saw how the floor scoring was going in this meet, and then Shay does Shay on floor, and you're like, oh well, this is getting a ten. How if if the previous routines were nine nine two five nine nine five. This is obviously going to be a 10. And then, first of all, her music didn't start quite right. And it's like, okay, well, this is not. Like, you're just treating Shay's floor routine like you think it's some other floor routine. Where it's like, she can't start a nanosecond off the music. It ruins the whole moment. Like, it's like, do these people not understand? This is not just like some Wizard of Oz dancing at a level 10 meet. Like, this is Shay Campbell. This is important. Um then she goes, you thought it, for sure it was going to be a 10. She gets a 10 9, 9 0 split from the two judges. And I want to know your evaluation. What do we think was one judge? Who, Which judge was corrupt? Which judge was correct? What are we doing here? So this is the thing. First of all, I want to say, when I talked about her not being at full strength when they did the Meet the Bruins and just not doing her full dance, and I couldn't wait to see it being full out, this is what I'm talking about. This is the full out dance and not just like marking it, but actually like going for it. Um, and it's so fantastic. So this is the thing. Watching this routine, um, she does her full in first pass. Her legs are a tiny bit separated, but she lands perfectly upright. And we know that they don't deduct what happens in the air stays in the air in NCAA gymnastics. <laughs> like, I'm surprised they don't say that in the trainings. Like, they say, like, don't use all three tenths of deductions because these are the top athletes. Um, the amplitude, I would say, in her second pass, you could take for that. But do the judges ever take for that? Because she's doing it like a front layup, front full, just to fulfill the requirement. You could take for amplitude, but then she does her double back. And also lands perfectly upright, takes a totally controlled step, basically mm -hmm. sticks it. This is, I don't understand the split. I don't know where that tenth, a whole tenth, not a half a tenth is coming from. I feel like the other judge probably, yes, there's deductions, but so are there in every single 10 we see in NCAA gymnastics. It's so hard for us to find an actual 10 in NCAA gymnastics that by the code, which is the level 10 code the dev code um they're supposed to be using that's a real one so for the standard of gymnastics especially sec gymnastics this is a 10 i feel like this is one of those routines that cannot be a 10 because of the built-in form deduction on the full twisting double tack which is staggered knees shins apart foot position i a feel like you head. can just you can, I'm saying, this is what I'm getting to, 
by if you are reading the code and doing the assignment as a judge, you're taking a full tenth for that. Is then taking a full tenth skewing the ranking? Yeah, because that's not how everyone is being evaluated. But if you are deducting for Audrey Davis's bars dismount and she's scoring like nine eight seven five or nine nine two five, even though it's so much better than everyone else, but also similarly, I think has is like a perfectly wonderful routine in almost every way, but has a built-in form deduction that you kind of have to take every time. It's similar. So if you're not giving, if Audrey Davis isn't giving a 10, I'm not getting a 10. Shea Campbell isn't getting a 10 on floor. I kind of yes. feel like it's a similar, similar situation, but again, reinforces inconsistency because. Right. I I'm expected upset both judges to give it a 10. Right. I'm upset because one judge did their job and actually judged it correctly, which is you took deductions in the air, which are real deductions. Whereas most of the time we see judges not take that. So the 9-9 judge, we're actually commending you for doing your job. We're just upset because not all judges are as responsible as you are. That's what I'm saying. And this is the whole problem. That's why I ignore the scores, Spencer. And I know <laughs> you don't listen to me because I tell you to go against your very nature, your spreadsheet mm -hmm. heart. But, you know, there it is. Yeah. It's truly um, math phobic of you in a way that I find <laughs> <the hurt. laughs> You're really, you know, denying my internal nature. All right, so one of my favorite things that has happened lately is that, <laughs> oh, and by favorite, I mean horrible, because we've broken Bart Connor, and that's oh, irresponsible of gymnastics to do, because he's a treasure, and that's not allowed. But even Bart had that's to go on Twitter about the scoring, because he was so upset about it. Bart Connor Say, went on a Twitter rant. Bart oh, Connor, you guys. It was great, but also, I like, just let Bart be... <laughs> Don't upset Bart. Um, here are some of my favorite choice quotes. Yes. The weakest link in the entire ecosystem of women's college gymnastics is the lack of consistent quality judging. All of the athletes, most coaches, and most schools do a fantastic job. They deserve better. A 9-8 has become participation medal. Oh. Zing. Boom. Problem is that there's no meaningful separation in scores between good, great, and exquisite performances anymore. There are many, many excellent gymnastics judges out there, but some, I am afraid, don't have the continuing education and training to see these things, and some just don't have the guts to throw a 9-6. Uh, oh, this Poetry. Was, it's sheer poetry. <laughs> this was very generous of Bart. They just don't have the, <laughs> the continuing education. No. They literally are told in their training. Now, Open to interpretation, I would say, by some people. But I think, uh, it, and this is the problem, it's open to interpretation. They are not operating by the code that they're supposed to be operating, which is the Dev National uh, Level 10 code. That's what they're supposed to be using. That is the actual problem with this whole system. Um, but I do love, of course, it's Bart Connor, because he was just like, oh, well, they're, you know, they're doing their jobs. They're just, you know, they're not, they're not getting the continuing education. <laughs> so thoughtful of him to say so not blamey um so then anything out about else about bart that you want to add no i mean you ha you had an enthusiastic and then so i'm excited to okay. hear where that was going so then greg <laughs> marsden we talked about this a little mm -hmm. on um on college and cocktails on friday but greg marsden godfather of N ncaa gymnastics um <laughs> who it wants nothing to do with this bullshit anymore. Nothing said, if I am nominated for any committees, I will decline. If I am elected, I will decline to serve. Like he is so done with this because he has been fighting this fight. He was a co like uh, 30 plus years. He was an NCAA coach trying to get these rules changed and couldn't get them changed. And so he's done with you. He's done with everyone. So his response was a post from 2023 where he said, like yeah these are all the problems and basically we um th we need uh number two mishandling of the college code of points composition requirements i would just like to interrupt you and say i'm five years old because you just said we need number two <laughs> 
<laughs> Number two in his why is NCA scoring mm -hmm. here again. Number three, increasingly coaches, fans, and some uh, social media call for higher or even 10.0 scores. Uh, number four, no oversight. How many times have you, we said this on the show, no oversight or accountability for judges, no oversight or accountability for the judges resulting in selective application of required deductions with no repercussions. In some instances, the judging seems almost performative. Exactly. Hence us being mad at a judge for doing their actually actual job about Jay Campbell's. Uh, and by us, I mean me. Shane Campbell's floor team. <laughs> and, and he goes on to talk about the stuff that we've talked about previously. Uh, the, you know, the women's judging uh, association needs to be professionalized. And, the, and what, you know, Bart also went on in one of his rants. It was so exciting. And he was like, you know, what needs to be done? We need an answer for this. And I'm like, yeah, what needs to be done is the NCAA, a $3 billion organization, needs to actually hire the judges and regulate this like they do for other sports. They do it at regionals and championships, but the whole rest of the year, it's the coaches evaluate the judges. You guys, I'm not making that up. You didn't, you no, you didn't, you don't have to stop or pause or go back. The coaches evaluate the judges. So of course they are invested in a, in a, a system that they benefit from. So this is the whole problem. And I very much enjoyed being like, Greg Marsden was like, you had me for all these years. Uh, you should have done what I said a long time ago. So basically I'm electing Tabitha Yim to go to the NCAA and kick some ass. She seems to be the only one that can get things done. So Tabby Stanford, mm. it's up to you now. <laughs> you seem to be the peacemaker. The only one that's like neutral in the system. Or we need more uh, more things to happen, like the Tennessee tipping point meet. And so all the coaches that have benefited from this judging for years will want an overhaul. Suffering a kind of a bit of a Greg Marsden situation in that I, I, I don't know. I feel like every year we have like, oh, here's our solution for judging. And then it's like, Ugh, all right. Yeah, it's bad. Nothing happens. They don't change anything. So I'm like, yeah, all right. I mean, change whatever you want. <laughs> but I will say one thing I want to add to the like discussion of obviously things need to be adjusted, changed, fixed, all of that is the problem of the judges angle, which was really noticing at this uh, Alabama Florida meet that was on ESPN too. So we had like, you know, the good camera angles the good camera work which we don't always have at a lot of broadcasts but we saw this happen very specifically and distinctly on ellie lazari's bars routine so she's in the bars lineup this week does a beautiful routine dismounts hops to the side toward coach owen field who is you know fist pumping and being like you know what my job is sell a 10 my job is to be my, use my enthusiasm to try to get you a 10. I'm not spotting anything right now, but I'm going to try to get you a 10. Um, she hops to the side right toward him. Are we surprised that the judge who is angled very specifically so that he is looking at Owen and can't see anything was the judge at the top end of the crazy range on this dismount? No, we're not surprised because if you're watching from the camera angle we have, um, what was this judge even able to see? Owen's butt, Nothing? which is great. I enjoy a view of Owen's butt. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, but I mean, it. You know, you you can't have it all. You either get some of Owen's butt, or you don't get to see the dismount. Everybody wins. That's what job. I'm saying. <laughs> um, it it crystallized the situation that we, the you know, all. 150,000 people, whoever, however many, we'll see how many people watched this meet, 100, 150,000. All of us watching at home had a better angle than this judge did in order to evaluate this landing. So of course we're upset about the scoring making no sense because we had the better view and could see more accurately what happened. And so I think this happens all the time. Uh, any discussion of how to improve future college judging has to to me has to acknowledge that sitting at a card table kind of near the apparatus is insufficient in the year 2024 that video review and multiple angles has to be 
part of any future judging solution. And I recognize there are a lot of problems with that, namely like expense and speed and many other things. But those have to be, okay, now how do we fi- deal with those problems and manage them? Because you can't just sit at one angle, kind of low, kind of behind some coaches at, at floor level, especially, and expect to be able to give an accurate score. Because yeah, so many F- judges F- are simply not sitting in a position to do their job. FIG being an apparatus level is a much better way. Even though they're spread out, they're all on one side, which is a problem, but they're spread out across the whole length of the apparatus. But yeah, this is a problem because if you you should be able to spot, but if you're in a real position to spot, then you're always going to be blocking the, the landing in some way. Because you have to be close to the bar to spot this in case someone pings. Oh, the horror. Some upsets that happened this week. Okay. Oh, my God. This meet was so close. Florida lost at home to Alabama. Yeah. Oh, it was exciting. It doesn't, doesn't typically happen. Yeah. No. See, it was Even exciting because the scores were so close, Jessica. Yes. It was super exciting. Um, Luisa Blanco doing her layout step out series on beam. Layout step out, layout step out with her fingers perfect upside down. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful, you guys. And then LSU lost to Missouri at Missouri. Mm, oh God, that team, you guys, this was, a, that was also a great meet. Uh, yeah, but they had all kinds of problems on floor. LSU did. And Missouri was like, mm-hmm. mm, you're welcome for us being joyful and happy this <laughs> whole time. Even though they had a crazy fall on, on beam, they had um, Sienna Schreiber. Yeah. Sienna Schreiber. Who's their ninja on beam fell off and they were like, no problem. We've got this. We'll still win. Oh, it was good. That was a great meet. Very exciting. So these upsets can still happen, even not following the rules. (laughs) Not following the rules is what they love. (laughs) Love (laughs) not following the rules. The whole point of the thing. Um, Ranking movers, individuals category. We have Haley Bryant took over the number one in ranking in the all around by 0.002 ahead of Maya Lazan. So, you know, a bit a huge margin. She's ahead by points and false. Um, Maya Lazan tied Sage Kellerman for the top spot on vault. Um, and Mackenzie Wilson, who got a 10, tied Haley Bryant for third. Noteworthy on the vault rankings, and why, specifically why I bring this up, only one Yurchenko one and a half is in the top five on vault. One Yurchenko one and a half, three handspring pike halves, and shake handles Yurchenko fall. Mm-hmm. So I want your thoughts on pros and cons of your Chenko full pros and cons of your Chenko one and a half. And you know how apparently the handspring pike half is a really a super extremely unique and original vault that, that we never so see before, funny. which we learned this week. It's so funny when people like weren't born when this used to be the only vault that anybody did like a handspring front and handspring uh, front half uh that they're like we've never seen this i never trained it because yeah but there was a time people weren't allowed to do your chenkos basically they were like oh it's way like front tumbling and your chenkos no too dangerous um but yeah i think basically teams were like oh you know what's easier to spot than a forward landing vault a half turning vault where you can see the floor the whole time let's start teaching people even if they didn't learn these or haven't done a front handspring since level three um Let's start teaching this because they have all the power. It won't be hard for them to do these um, these handspring front halves. Uh, I think it's really smart. And all the teams that started training these like over the summer or a couple of years ago with their teams, as soon as the um, the Yurchenko full got downgraded to a 995, were really smart to do it. And I think uh, also people like Shay Campbell staying with her Yurchenko full was also really smart because she flares it out has been able to flare it out every year and she can stick it all the time. So if you have a, why risk the stepping forward or the falling of your Chenko full, if you know you can see the ground like a Suki Fisters and it's Suki Fister. It's not Fisters. There's just one. Mm. Um, or uh, one Gabby Steven. There's one Suki Fister. These are the things we remember. Your chinko full. Also, you can see the landing. You know, as long as you. I mean, don't get me wrong. We've all seen the people that first learn in the your chinko fulls and just whoo, right into the ground, barely turning. 
but you know, the Shea Campbells of the world. So yeah, I think this yeah. is super exciting and I can't wait for the backlash when they downgrade the handspring front pike half. I don't think they're going to downgrade the handspring front pike half. They better not. I'll be pissed. I think my issue on, so my take or my take on should a gymnast who is, you know, has a great amplitude on vault stay with a Yurchenko full versus going to the Yurchenko one and a half worth a half tenth more is that Shay Campbell is the exception rather than the rule and that it makes sense for her because hers is so good and she's going to get nine, nine or nine, nine, five, like every time because there's nothing to take in the air. It's just whether she sticks it or not, but that's true for her and almost no one else. No, because everyone else at least straddles in their pre-flight. There's a straddle, or it's not as sure, the landing control is not as sure thing as it yeah. is for Shea, because she's so high. She's like, this is, come on. Yeah. And she's been doing it for so long and is so comfortable with it. So I think that it works for her, but for most people who have the option and who are maybe in between, it probably ends up being worth it to go for more difficulty, because as we know, deductions are ignored all the time and so everything is scored too high so you know if you have knees bent in the air just you know go to a home meet and suddenly those knees are apparently straight so it's fine if you have a form deduction it doesn't matter so the air on the side of your chanko one and a half unless it's Shea Campbell. yes although i do have to say i was i was talking about the handspring front halves that have the uh split the legs apart in the pre-flight. Shea Campbell also has leg separation in her pre-flight too. So technically it is not a perfect 995. But as we know from all the handspring front pikes, nobody takes pre-flight deductions because <laughs> they don't follow the rules. That's why you ignore, ignore the judging. <laughs> I but am. I can't. It's the I am, only fun part. <laughs> I am very happy. I'm not, I'm very happy. I'm okay with Lisa Blanco, Blanco taking over. Uh, the number one spot on bars from Raina Worley. On bars. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm right with that. I'm okay with this. Thoughts I like a nice on, back and forth. Thoughts on the college bars composition, which I'm going to define as mount the low bar, glide kip cast handstand, Maloney to bail or pack, and then maybe cast half turn if you need to, or just cast toe circle up to high bar, giant, giant double layout. As is this sufficient, even if it's perfect, like Lily Smith, where it's just beautiful, but this is the composition. Is that sufficient in your mind as an impressive feat of tenniness for college gymnastics? I would like college gymnastics to um, have a rule that if you do any kind of if your feet, if you do any kind of circle or squat jump uh, to the high bar, mm -hmm. then that you can't start from a 10. Like, it's just we're, this is, you know, it's not, we're past that. Like, it's a no for me. Do a hecked, you know, squat jumps? No. No. That you what doing a squat we're... jump should not start from a 10. But if we're then doing like a Luisa Blanco composition, which is like that, but she has a shap half typically in her bars routine. She can do whatever she wants, but typically <laughs> has like that. So there's no, that but. and then you meant she has a squat jump, but also does a Shapash half. No, <laughs> she <laughs> does. I, what I, let me clarify. Luisa Blanco does a no same bar release bars routine, right? But has a Shapash half in there. So yes. this is now we've moved to sufficient difficulty for you. It doesn't. Ha Do you feel it has to have a same bar release, which is, a, I think, a valid contention? That's the thing. I'm okay. I mean, I don't. I in my priority list, mm -hmm. no squat ons is number one, and then yeah, sure you could add um, a same bar release requirement. But for me, it's just as exciting of a routine to see someone do three or two uh, between the bar releases with a flip, um, with a real change of position, hand, you know, not just a hecht. So I feel like maybe there should be a, either you have to have a same bar release or you have to have a flip of a between bar transition. Like a pack or a hard wash. Recites. 
No one will ever do that. You get to <laughs> but no, but like, so you mean a pack? Because yeah. you find the path of least resistance. I think well, my or okay or a uh, half a flip. So if you go from swing to handstand, because you're still, you know, that's not a full flip like a pack. Um, but you're taking yourself, you know, like as Yezheva. I would say my the my pet peeve or the thing I focus in on on bars college composition again is not necessarily same bar release, but I don't think that a skill like a bail to handstand should fulfill your turning requirement. I think you should have to show some pirouetting. Uh, it's I not the, like, the only thing you're going to do. I know, but I'm just saying in terms of priorities for things you want yeah. to add to requirements, I'd put like pure wedding, like brr, way down at the and bottom. And I'd put it like, obviously, the most important thing about bars is whether you can hit a <laughs> vertical handstand position because it's so satisfying. That is also why I'm not as strong on same bar release is because I'm like same bar releases. I mean, it adds risk. So that's entertaining. Oh to my me, God. But people love same bar releases. I know. I'm saying how normals feel about same bar releases is how I feel about like a uh, half, like cast half turn on the low bar that actually finishes in handstand and doesn't finish 20 degrees past and gets away with it. God, you, I'm surprised there's a in. book. You have a book in your room that is actually tilted and leaning to the side and it's not straight up and down and they could still guys, concentrate on your life. That got saying. so bored. While I was talking about pirouettes, that she started looking at the books behind me on the bookshelf. Like her attention span just went boom as I Pretty started talking. Like about an audience like, watching a bunch of routines of pirouettes. Oh, but anywho, perfect. my I mean, question gymnastics. for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's only week four, Spencer. It's only week four. It's okay. gonna get worse. <laughs> Is he to being ranked high on beam, um, competing once, getting a 10, and then leaving? <laughs> Basically, because <laughs> Sid Morris and Brooklyn Rowway are still tied for number one on beam, both of whom competed in week one, got a 9975, and haven't been hurt from since. All right, and <laughs> Miley O'Keefe has gotten like three tens on beams? beams? <laughs> Two tens, but a fall on all of the beams. And this is the problem. You can compete once and stay number one with a 9975. Get two for now, right? It'll change later. But yeah, just so you know, you guys, if you yeah. look at those rankings, just keep in mind who isn't doesn't compete on those events anymore. <laughs> they left. Um, we also, other change, um, Myla Zahn take took over the number one ranking on floor and is the top ranked beamer who's competed more than once. So, I yeah, it's a, like the Maya Lazan story is what we're saying in the uh, individual rankings. I feel like if, um, this is what I say every year, if Cal had more TV coverage of every single meet, people would be more obsessed with them. And I feel like they would, they're finally getting the scores that reflect the gymnastics they've been doing for a long time. Precision. The, yeah, they're Oklahoma West is what I'm saying. <laughs> So you're um, saying if they weren't on, like, Pac-12 Bay area of affiliate only, that yes. there would uh, be more attention? Yeah. It makes my eye twitch. Okay, we have to talk about why the week is canceled. And number one about why everything is canceled is because Adeline Kenlin got injured on oh ball. Gosh. It's the most upsetting thing. I'm. This is terrible. This is terrible, terrible, terrible. I don't know how I'm going to function. I know. God. This is why we can't have nice things. Also, Mabanta is out. Ella Mabanta was out for Denver. Um, Cade Scormley for Kentucky was on crutches. We no. just talked about the freshman, how much we're enjoying her and how she's going to be a star. And then she's immediately on crutches and it's our fault. Um, we saw, if you were watching the Cal Oregon State meet, we saw Ellie Weaver get injured on floor. So it's just like, ugh. we're we're they're dropping like flies, Jessica. I know it's very upsetting. I was I was hoping maybe Adam Kenlin, like you know, just injured a finger so she could at least do beam. You don't need fingers. It wasn't a finger. It, I know it, it, it was it was low. It was, yes. oh. We saw <laughs> it happen. Could she do a hands only, no legs beam routine? If anyone <laughs> could do it, Adam Kenlin could do All it. All right, compose compose your hands only beam routine. 
<laughs> what hey, would that look like? Hands only. Your team carries you over. They put you down. You do a press handstand uh, right. mount, half turn, mm -hmm. swing down yeah. into a uh, press into a handstand. Then you do from there, from your handstand, then you do a Kvisto, which is a. With uh, you go back, swing back down, and then do a straddle front flip onto your crotch. <laughs> okay, That's yeah. Right, though. Um, and then, so you now have a flight element, but you need it in a series. So you have to do two in a row, crotch to crotch. <laughs> You've also fulfilled the perineum load of the beam requirement with that. Right. You've had your handstand. Um, then you press up to a handstand pirouette. Now you've fulfilled your roll, straddle back down, do a shoulder roll or something just to make sure you have two rolls. A leap. A leap's going to be trouble. Um, to fulfill <laughs> the leap, you do another press handstand or just, you know, uh, not uh -huh. a kick up, but you can kick up with the other foot. Oh, oh, step down onto one foot, then do switch, switch, mm -hmm. because you don't, you only need one leg for a switch, switch. You do a standing <laughs> switch, switch, which Adeline can go, could totally do into immediate. Gator fall off the side. I did it. I did it. I won. Yes. Oh my God. I'm so creative. I can't even stand it. I would now like a judge to evaluate that routine and write in and be like, okay, this routine starts from an 8.8, .8, what you have just described. It fulfills zero requirements. <laughs> um, I have a problem with la maybe landing a gainer fall on one foot well i mean yeah you'd get a deduction for landing on one foot but i mean you know she could get a nine, Would nine. You know? it's not healthy you shouldn't do it mm, but okay. I, no one ever said gymnastics was healthy no. that's the lesson of this segment is that no one should be doing any of this and adeline did elite gymnastics so she's already chosen unhealthy so it's fine <laughs> all right i love it Whoa. i'm there Speaking okay. of, we have some opportunities for comedy this week, some further opportunities for comedy, not the foot-free beam routine that Jessica <laughs> just created. Um, we need to give, so we have a new award, apparently, which is the high five in the face of the week, because as we've discussed, gymnasts can uh, do beam routines but cannot walk on the ground. They also cannot high five. And we maybe need to integrate this into early training, like how you always say ballet should be integrated into early training. High five lessons, I think, are really an underrated point, and we need to work on them more because it's getting to be a problem, as Janelle McDonald learned this week when she got fully high fived right in the nose by Emma Malibuio yeah. after bars. And it was wonderful. I have to say that the only time, I mean, I have high fived like to the side, but the only time at gymnastics when someone really high fived me, uh, my hand smacked me right in the face. <laughs> my hand just flipped right back and hit me in the head. And I was like, all right, well, that was more aggressive than I was anticipating. So yes to the lessons is what I'm saying, Spencer. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important because it's every week. Yeah. Like multiple times. And I mean, I guess for sheer numbers of high fives, because it's required that you do a high 10 for every teammate to every teammate and staff member after every single routine, like the yeah. sheer number of high fives that are happening in a meet, it's got to be up in the millions. So of course you're going to have mistakes, but that's what gymnastics is. You can hit 10 beam routines in a row in the gym, but if you miss the one in competition, that's the one that matters. You've got to hit your high fives in competition. All right. We also need to talk Amen. about something else that happened on the Pac-12 network that is a, a, an abomination and it may be an actual crime because this Cal Oregon State meet, the graphics of the scores, I cannot explain to you how upsetting I find this. It went beam, bars, floor, vault, total. Yeah. What hell scape would have to occur for a person to list the events in this in order. the wrong order beam bars floor vault what is that where did that come from no it is it's very upsetting did they that's go the worst thing that happened to order? me this year no 
Oh, because bars would be first. Bars would be first if it was alphabetical order. There's nothing that would ever justify the events being listed in this order. No. And this isn't the first time it's happened. At first, I thought you were just going to be, you're mad about the math. So I was like, yeah, the math. But I was like, the math looks correct. So yes, the order is wrong. And that's unforgivable. <laughs> it's gymnastics. Everyone should know the order of events by now. This is very upsetting. Very upsetting. I'm not over it. I'm not yeah, over it. I agree. We have some elite news to discuss, um, which directly ties in to our discussion of uh, UCLA and Emma Malibuyo and the bars situation, um, which is why doing college gymnastics and making an Olympic team is hard, especially if you're not competing for the United States, because they've made it easier for college gymnasts to qualify to an Olympic team. It used to be, no, you do one or the other. We don't want you if you're in college. We want you after mm -hmm. college when you've had four years of competing 14 times uh, in a year, because normally you only compete three times in a year. So at three meets per year. So yes, we'll take you now. But Olympics.com has an interview with uh, Emma Bali up, and she is representing the Philippines. And her schedule, are you ready for this? So mm -hmm. she is no. actively in college at UCLA, not, you know, your community college around the corner. Um, How dare and you? So four weeks, a four-week period, she has the Cairo World Cup on February 15th and 18th, followed by the World Cup in Cottbus in Germany, February 22nd, 25th. Then she comes back to the U.S., has a meet UCLA versus Stanford on March 1st, and then another World Cup in Baku, Azerbaijan, all the way over there, uh, March 7th through 10th. And all this while maintaining, what do you have to maintain? A C average or something to be a college athlete. But still, she's an upperclassman now. It's not like she's taking her beginner biology 101 that Charity took in high school. So all that and trying to qualify her to the Olympics. So, I and mean, also while not like murdering someone, which I would do with trying to maintain the schedule, like not getting arrested for some sort of crime, you also have to do during this, which is not a small feat. Oh my God. And all the school you're going to miss, and then having to like write papers on planes that where you just want to sleep the whole time. The only advantage of this is, is being like, you know, f five feet tall so that she can sleep in small places. This is the, the one advantage to this, this situation. But yeah, mm. um, this is crazy. Um, and now, and people, you know, I, we have seen a video of, there's a video out there of this, um, some guy presenting to his wife and her friends about whether or not Taylor Swift can make it from Japan, where she's doing a tour, to her boyfriend's football game, and doing the math. So you guys, I would like to know <laughs> yeah. what is the travel math and how many days does Malibuyo have to get herself unjet lagged, compete, re-jet lagged in the opposite direction going back to UCLA and then jet lag herself again? And does she need to get how many days should, ahead of time should she start using those nighttime glasses like the Netherlands team <laughs> uses when they travel so they get adjusted to and Australia uses them, I, I think, too. So. You guys, we'll, we'll wait for your presentations. Please send them in to gymcastic at gmail.com. And we can... I feel like the, the entirety of the Gymternet, the UCLA team, needs to have like a series of presents prepared for Emma Malibuyo as like... Because if anyone's deserve like earned a treat after yeah. like getting through a schedule, like her favorite things, her favorite foods nap time schedules pillows and comforters and blankets for like basically everything around that stanford meet like she will have accrued so much of like earning everyone being like you're perfect let's treat you like you're perfect after this um this, Malibu, yeah. this should be a documentary series just on these two months of her life and also she needs a sponsorship her nil sponsorship should be like doordash or something or grubhub so she <laughs> literally and like a comforter and some pillows so she can just lie in bed when she's not at school but never has to like shop do or laundry service oh you guys laundry mm. when you're a college athlete 
the worst. Unless you go to one of the schools where they let you add your regular clothes to your workout clothes because they do your workout laundry for you, but they don't let you. If you try to sneak your regular clothes in there, they get all mad. Even if it's like your underwear. <laughs> You're just like, well, I work out in my underwear. Anyway, you guys, not that I ever did that, obviously. But I might have been desperately trying to make friends with a laundry guy. He was also hot. <clears throat> and even though I wasn't really allowed to have my laundry desk because I, was, I wasn't technically an athlete, but the student trainers got to. Some gym internet news okay. happening this week. Gymnastics Australia CEO Alexander Ash has stepped down. So their high performance director, Chris O'Brien, has been appointed the interim CEO. Do you think someone was like, wait, our national champion wasn't put on our world team even after uh, an inquiry said that he was right to that he was wronged in this scenario and should you guys should repick the team and you picked again without him? Do you think that's why she stepped down? That would make too much a uh, sense. Mm. Mm. That would be why we would do something. So you can assume it's not why things actually happen. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Mary Lee Tracy is coaching at the Canadian national team camps. Um, also coaching there is Amy Borman, Simone Biles, a former coach. Georgia Gymnastics had violations. Did you see this? I love reading about the dumb sports viola violations. It's one of my favorite categories of articles to read oh because God. the Georgia Gymnastics uh, team got in a balloon trouble. They got in, literally, they got in trouble for balloons. This is from the Athens Banner Herald. So um, there was a bunch of other violations, like the whole school, but we don't care about yeah, the other sports. Yeah, and everything like has to like self-report their recruiting violations. It's the yeah. whole thing. And they're always hilarious because they're always the dumbest things you can possibly ever think of. And Georgia Gymnastics got in trouble for balloons. Yep. Balloons and recruits hotel room contacting an a recruit on social media before the date that you're allowed to contact people. Uh, recruits taking uh, pictures on their visit. Um, and the consequences, wait till you hear how serious these consequences mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. and how much you should fear these consequences because they're so extreme, Spencer. They got a letter and they couldn't contact anyone for two weeks. <gasps> oh my God, the horror, Spencer. How are yeah. they going to ever compete again? What are they going to do? They have to shut down the whole program. I mean... Does this remind you of the time that Georgia lost a scholarship because uh, Suzanne Yachlin took her let gave her gymnast a trip on a plane to New York City to see a show or something and then flew them back on a plane. And because of that, they lost one scholarship. Did it hurt the program at oh, all? Those were the days. Those were the, oh. those were the days. Our good old days. Oh. Our, our best years. <laughs> yes. When you could be like, you want, with, there's no NIL. So you want me to come here? Here's the things that I want. Um, I think that uh, NIL means you can never punish someone like they punish uh, the Georgia gymnastics. Excuse me. Georgia got a letter of admonishment, which if you're me is like the w most stressful thing I could possibly, I would have to quit immediately if I ever got a letter of admonishment. <laughs> that is so stressful. I think you're, you are downplaying how upsetting that can be. So, but yeah, it's almost like all of these rules are dumb and also who cares? <laughs> Right. I mean, it also like, even if they took away, okay, uh, LSU, we're taking away all 12 of your scholarships. And they'd be like, <laughs> they'd be like collective? Do people call, <laughs> pull, like pick up a phone to call people anymore? That That's not how they do it. Um, they do, 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 call up their collective and be like, we need money for 12 scholarships. That's not, what, that's not what calling collect means. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're dialing your NIL collective. The collective, excuse me, the collective. Um, the This is why I go back to any punishments should be directed to the coach's salary and never to the team because it only hurts when it hits your own pocket because the school <laughs> can bolster you in whatever they, they want. Your personal pocket, which I'm sure the collective would just, you know, find a way to increase your pay and make up for that too. But should it be public like a, like a, What's more public shaming than that? 
I don't know. Uh, you have I don't to wear think any of this team leotard. Real, so. <laughs> you have to wear your team leotard during the meet. That would be. Can you imagine <laughs> Jay Clark doing that? Oh, they could bar you from postseason. That's a real punishment. But that yeah, but what, for what? On what grounds? Balloons? You're barring someone from the postseason for balloons? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Or a plane to see a show. Oh, okay. they won the national championship. Let them go to New York is what I, I say. Now you just have an NIL sponsor would just put them on yeah. the plane and take them. Uh, the layout step out. How old do you think it is, Spencer? Well, Don't I do know it. how old it is because we've talked. We spent like 10 minutes talking about this before we started recording. I mean, I can fake it sometimes, but not, you know, an hour and 15 minutes into the show. I can't fake it at this point. I got nothing oh, I, already, I already said it in the intro. Damn it. Okay. So the layout step out turned 50 years old this year. This is why I always say your grandma did the series. I, we, it's hard to find any gymnastics your grandma didn't at least do in practice. Didn't Even though you might that. be competing it. But she tried it in practice in a pit in the Soviet Union back in the day full of mattresses. <laughs> we have a whole episode on it. So 50 years ago. Aurelia Dobre, not the 87 world champion Aurelia Dobre. Shockingly, there's two people in Romania who did gymnastics named Aurelia Dobre. <laughs> Original she recipe Aurelia Dobre. Aurelia Dobre. In 1974, did a layout step out in, you know, beam shoes and with fluffy hair fluffs uh, on beam. And uh, we only have video of this because of the great Hardy Fink, who is an incredibly important historian and filmed lots of these things in gymnastics. And the media did not report on it back in the day, but Hardy Fink has a video. So as far as we know, this is uh, one of the first, first ever uh, actual done in a competition at a world championships of uh, layout step outs. It's very exciting. 74. So thank you, Hardy Fink. And thank you, Uncle Tim of gymnastics-history.com, our gymnastics historian PhD. Real facts. He literally has a PhD. We have some letters. If you have feedback for us, please send them into gymcastic at gmail.com, or you can always put them in the forum. We try to answer questions live. We answer a lot of questions live on college and cocktails on anything you want, except Spencer's love life. because He refuses to talk about that. Ugh, rude. But did you see that Eurovision? They have that um, the Irish singer who's like Bjork, sort of like very weird, that just got elected. <laughs> like, she's like the witch who were the witches who were on your vision? Like the witch. <laughs> who were that witch band? What are we doing at this point? <laughs> I'm, trying... <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to talk about your personal life, which is your love okay. of Eurovision, which, which, which ties, <laughs> which ties into an Irish witch being given the singing spot for the Eurovision. You will like her very much. Her, okay. She has her hair like braided into large circles around her head. Anyway, I'm very excited for you, Spencer. That's what I'm saying. Now, Good. can you read this piece of feedback about attending my first meet from Aaron? So I finally got to go to a meet here in my state. I have wanted to go for years, but never really got a chance, even though it's just about over an hour away. Listening to Jessica say you just have to see it in person made me just die to go. Been listening to the podcast for about four years now and recently joined as a gym nerd. I just wanted to share how much fun I had at the University of Kentucky versus University of Georgia last night. My mom and sister-in-law went with me, and I'm telling you all, I haven't been this happy in a long time. Been dealing with my fiancé having throat cancer, and he's in treatment, so my family wanted to do something for me. And this was the best that they could have done for me. I want to tell you all how much this community means to me. There are days that I'm not sure I'm going to get through, and I turn my podcast on, and it takes me to my happy place. Oh, I almost forgot. Raina Worley finally got her 10, and I was there to see it. Have a good day, my fellow gym nerds. <laughs> this makes me so happy. I'm so glad we could be there for you. Wishing your husband well. I'm so glad you finally went to see a meet in person because it is magical, right? Oh, you guys got to see gymnastics in person, especially a college meet because the fans are nuts. They're crazy. Everyone's so <laughs> into it. It's so fun. An important follow-up letter from College and Cocktails where we discussed losing teeth. Of course we did. And I was like, of course there's a doctor who'll write in. So this is from Sarah Walker, MDMS. 
As Jessica said, she probably would get an email from a doctor slash dentist. I figured I would oblige. She is correct that the best option currently is to stick the tooth back in its socket. This is actually why I travel with a sports ball mouth guard in my med kit, despite mostly covering gymnastics and figure skating. If I had to put the tooth back in, the mouth guard would hold it in place while I get them to a dentist. Tooth saver solution is second best, but unlikely for bystanders to have, followed by milk. And never try to clean or brush off the tooth because you could damage the roots so it can't be replaced. Nerves, very important. Don't touch them. Don't mess with them. Just stick them back. Stick your tooth back in its place. That is the important message. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that follow-up. Stick your tooth back in your mouth, but don't swallow it. This is very important. That's why you should put a mouth guard. I always travel with my mouth guard for snoring slash grinding my teeth to a pulp. So I, if I ever lost a tooth, please don't let that happen by hitting my face during a single bar release, which almost (laughs) happened uh, at the college meet that we were watching on Friday, could put that mouth guard in. Good to know. I hadn't thought of that. Um, Because if anyone's going to swallow their tooth, it would be me. Beat jumps BS. Steph says, beat jumps are bullshit. Mm. If you only rise two inches above the beam, it is an atrocity. And counting it in combination with another element is insulting. Don't get me started with cat leaps. Oh, Steph. (laughs) We are with you. You are our people. I'm so glad you found us. Absolutely. If you don't beat jump like you are skyrocketing to the moon with ballet shoes on your feet are so pointed and rising above the beam and they could take a picture of you and it just like you were hovering like a god done with it take it out of your routine <laughs> trash but Don't do you, you feel like it is unacceptable in the way that you feel feet on the bar up to the high bar is out you don't feel that beat jumps are out even as something you could count in combination you just wish the standard were higher I wish the standard was higher. Was higher. We, we rarely see a good beat jump on on beam. I mean, there are some that are beautiful, and they do look like someone just hovering, like a witch commanding gravity. Brilliant witches this week. Mm, uh, and every week. Yeah. Have you watched Sanctuary yet? No. Spencer! We have to discuss. Okay. Uh, gum chewing thoughts. Stephen says, what are your thoughts on the gum chewing from the coaches? The televised meets this weekend had Oklahoma's assistant coaches, Missouri head coach, and Alabama head coach all chewing gum like they are cows. For the 90 minutes that they are on TV, can't they cease from chewing? Okay, is this from Valerie Condos Field using her <laughs> alter ego st- name? Stephen, Stephen with a P.A. <laughs> um I I wonder, you know, you will love, Stephen, listen to College and Cocktails from this past weekend because I could not with the chewing. I was afraid for them that they were going to hurt themselves. Is this like a, I feel like uh, this is like a male sports ball thing that you grow up watching other men chew gum on the sideline coaching. So you think that this is part of the persona of being someone that you look like you're doing your job if you chew gum hard, right? It's like wearing a suit. And I think that's hard. like tobacco (laughs) old-timey male sports ball and then you had to replace that with gum because it's like a bad influence because you didn't want to get mouth cancer yeah but not because you didn't want to get mouth cancer but because because you know someone made you big league chew um yeah i i really wonder about this i would like to ask from from people who grew up thinking that if this is you and you're like chewing gum aggressively on television is how I communicate serious. Let us know where that came from. How did it evolve? But you think it's an image related choice. Like I think you're trying a, to pro- project something. I think it is um, something that is an unconsciously adapted persona. I don't think anybody's like, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? Get some big league chew and chew the whole thing on TV. I think it is a, um, I think it's something that you, like, I, I was thinking about this a lot this week. And I was okay, like, good, I remember good. when I all, I all grew up just watching sports ball when the males in the household had it on because there was no women's sports to watch. Hardly ever. Maybe there was a tennis every now and then during the Olympics. They showed a little 
of gymnastics, but it, there wasn't college gymnastics on, rarely got to watch anything else. So uh, the first, uh, in my gymnastics meets, when I competed and I fell, I would like stomp around, and put my hands on my hips and like walk in a circle because I literally thought, well, that's all you grow up knowing. How did I know that I was supposed to do anything else? This is what they do on TV when they miss the ball. So that's what I should do. Um, you know, and I was not indoctrinated with this, like girls are supposed to act a certain way stuff. So had an, I didn't, knew nothing else. Right. So I think I thought about that and I was like, I really think this is the same way that the, these coaches grow up seeing how they should act as coaches. Grumpily chewing, mm. aggressively grumpily chewing. So if you have theories, I'm very interested in your theories. Or if you were a gum chewing sports ball coach. Tell us. Obviously, it's not just men that do this. I feel like the softball. Also, I understand though in baseball and softball because it's so boring. It's so boring. <laughs> it's so non-sport. You can eat during it. That's that's <laughs> how boring it is. And don't come with me with my le your letters because I know. Okay, Legos <laughs> designer, the South. Uh, let's talk about this letter from Karen. Karen says, I've been a listener since 2012. I'm a huge gym nerd, obviously, and I love listening to the podcast, both because I agree with a lot of the things you and Spencer say, but also because I have different perspectives on some topics, both gymnastics related and otherwise, and it's great to hear how other people think and perceive situations in the world around them. One of the moments that made me laugh the most was when you were discussing the Lego Orchid, because my husband is the designer who created that set. I'm an American, as is my husband Mike, but we lived in Denmark since 2012 because he was hired by the Lego group to come here and be a designer. When I heard you mention that, it made me stop my run and bookmark the moment so I could play it for him when he got back home. When I got back home. He's not a gymnastics fan by any means, and he only tolerates me talking about it when it's World or Olympics, so I thought he would get a kick out of being mentioned. On a more serious note, there's also been the moments that made me stop and pause, but for less positive reasons. One came in the past few behind the scenes where you, you've talked about um, the South and the way we referred to the Civil War. I grew up in Georgia in the 90s and early 2000s, and while well, our teachers explained that that's what Southerners called the Civil War at the time, they never once referred to it that way in relation to how they are and we how they are, we should see it now. Of course, Kensley's experience is different than mine, but it just emphasizes for me the fact that it's really tricky and often a mistake to generalize large, group of, large groups of people or regions of any country or even state. I'm not saying the South doesn't have problems, and of course we do, but it's just a note of caution that I've learned from 11 years of living abroad that you should always qualify things you say as, in my experience, or some people in the South, just to make sure you're not further spreading stereotypes. It was eye-opening to me when I moved to Denver Denmark to hear some of the misinformation that many Americans, tr many Europeans truly believe about Americans. It has taught me so a lot about how much each word we say matters. I know that things slip out for me often, and I'm not on a podcast, so I can only imagine how much harder it is for you to avoid controversy. And I'm not saying you always should, but it's just, just a reflection that I've gathered over time. Um. So she's talking about the uh, that some people like Kensley were in their uh, books in when they grew up in the South, their like history books actually called the Civil War, the War of Northern Aggression instead of the Civil War. Um, and so, yeah, this is very good to know. I read your whole letter, Karen. Thank you so much. Taking to heart everything you said. Um, and also, oh, my God, I'm literally holding my Lego orchid right here, right now. It's one of my prized Lego possessions. And I'm so excited. Oh my God, I, t I was so upset when they when Denmark backed out of hosting worlds, can they do 2025? Oh my God, Spencer, if it's in Denmark, will you go 2025 worlds? I'll entertain the possibility. We could go to the Lego factory. I bet they have Lego <laughs> doors, even for adults, Lego designer. Oh, what a charmed life. So amazing. Um, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you, that you found us. So this Friday night is college and cocktails at eight Pacific. That's February 2nd. We're watching Oregon state versus Utah. And then the Cal Oklahoma meet. And um, next week's show is live from national team camp at 8 a.m. Pacific. That's on a Tuesday. Um, and if you are like me and you're about to travel a ton this year, make sure that you set Gymcastic to automatically download your episodes. Cause if you have missed some, you might not automatically be doing it. Um, and until then, remember it's a special week because we have 
Um, and remember that our live thing from camp is exclusive for Club Gymner members. They're the ones that can like log on live and ask questions live. So if you're not a member already, that's a reason to do it. And if you don't want anything to do with Club Gym Nerd, you can just donate to us on the bo very bottom of the page to join Club Gym Nerd. There's a donate button. And you can be like, I want nothing to do with any of your newsletters or special stuff or live things. <laughs> but I'm going to throw money at you because we always can use it. So thank you. Um, okay. Because it's a very special week where we had the first openly queer woman win the figure skating this week. Remember to take off on gay, split on rights, and we'll see you on Friday for College and Cocktails. Thanks for listening. <laughs>